Thanks, Joanna. Feel free to join me on. Guys, any time. What a, what a band that is, isn't it? Look at that. One Direction. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, <laughs> and Rich, I've sort of been thinking about this. I think you should have been the one sitting down. I should have been the one standing up on this, but that's fine. Okay, guys, we'll jump straight in because I'm going to try and get a bit, bit of time back. <clears throat> Excuse me. So welcome to the uh, Security First panel where we're going to discuss elevating cybersecurity through managed detection and response. AI enhanced resilience and reduced exposure. I'm delighted to be joined on the panel by Ellis uh, from Rapid7, head of XDR uh, practice in EMEA, Bal Dillon from Travis Perkins, our CISO, Ellis Reed, our solution architect from Integrity360, Ayed Al Qatar, get that right, Ayed, uh, um, um, from um, Trellex, our SecOps solution architect. And Scott joining us from Orca, the VP of EMEA. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, look, it's been, it's sort of no, um, it's no question that the, the service in demand in terms of in the industry is, is managed detection response at the moment. It's currently measuring at 1.29 billion in terms of the, as of 2023, from a, um, a compound annual growth rate. It's estimated to grow to over 6 billion. Uh, by 2030, so clearly, the, you know, it's recognised as a as a service that's making a big difference in the industry. Um, it, I think that when we look back in terms of the the services that customers were once uh, consuming, um, more traditional managed seam type services, where it was more of a um, an analysis of, of alerts and ultimately a lot of responsibility still still uh, resided within the customer space. So I think it has been recognised that MDR is making a big difference in the in the industry. But but in terms of obviously that, that's me saying that. I think in terms of you know from from a, a real customer experience, Bal, um, you know what is what is MDR meant for you as a CISO? What what is the difference that that's particular that's made for you? Um, I think from a corporate point of view, it gives us comfort that we've got somebody available um, on tap, ready, that can respond, which in real terms means we don't need people on call as much. Um, from a personal point of view, it means I get to have an extra glass of wine at night yeah. and just relax. Yeah. yeah, put your feet up like that beach picture. <laughs> Are you going for that CEO role as well that, that we were talking about earlier? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, exposure officer. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah. But it, it does give us that comfort that, you know, double checking and everything else, but you kind of know that there's somebody on tap that's continuously watching all the time yeah. and is able to respond as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and in terms of the, the key factors that you consider most when, when you were assessing for MDR providers, what, what were the, the, the key call outs and recommendations that, that, well, what were the key things that, that matter to you and what would you take from that in terms of recommending to fellow CISOs or, or in the room today? I think technology is all the same. doesn't matter what you really get. I mean, they all kind of use the same vendors underneath. For us, it was really about what the partnership would look like. Would it be a cultural fit? Because often when you have an MDR service, it's really about somebody else doing some of that response stuff and that the SecOps team might feel a bit uncomfortable with. So it's about really kind of saying, will we be able to work together and how would that work? Making sure whoever takes on the MDR service, they have the skills but also the expertise on hand are vendor neutral for us as well because we've invested a lot of time and money in technology that we've already invested in. And what we want to do is making sure that whoever we take on board can kind of build on that for us. And I think for us, that's what it's really about is that whole partnership and then the technology is secondary for us. Yeah, yeah okay. So the technology is important, but, but ultimately the, the, what you do with it, the, 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 the uh, processes and people behind that and that includes... That, that, that for us is fundamental. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Ellis, obviously, um, you know, you get involved in a lot of, of MDR conversations with customers. Do you, do you have any, anything to sort of add to that? What do you see in terms of key factors that, that differentiate in terms of uh, for choosing MDR services and, uh, with customers? Yeah. Normally, it comes down to the requirements and the environment that you're, you know, you're wanting to protect. Yeah. You know, customers have a list of technologies normally that they go, right, well, we've got this list of technologies. We're not too sure what enrichments we can get from these technologies. You know, are they getting the best return on investment not only on the technology that they've acquired, but also the output of that technology as well? You know, 
gone on the mindsets of, well, let's just throw everything at it and then expect uh, a clean result at the end. There's a lot of consultancy that goes into that, both from an education perspective, but also when you get to the detection and response element, you know, because what you want to do is whittle down the noise and understand that there's telemetry in there that, you know, is an attack sequence or the start of an attack chain or somebody's living off the land or something is going on where you're wanting a, an element of response. And those responses can change and alter depending on the customer's requirements and things within the environment. Yeah. So that's where it sort of, for me, goes beyond the technology element and it really goes into that service layer. So when people are looking for these types of things, it's trying to align the right type of service and response and technology to the customer's requirements, you know, in terms of well, what's important to them in terms of, you know, is there, are there a big data house? Do they have a big endpoint house? You know, do they have a big manufacturing requirement there? And how all of that then feeds into that service layer? So, again, taking the technology again is a key part to play in, the, you know, the detection. But what you're saying is how we map that to the, to the business needs and build detections around that. Uh, but specific for their environment and get it from there. That make, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ellis, obviously, um, from Rapid7, um, not other Ellis. Yeah, that's confusing. Right. I'm going to actually have all of There's, there's two of us on a panel. You don't see we normally two of us stop. in a single room, and there's three of us here today, <laughs> well, so it's a bit of an Ellis fest. That's another so conversation. So it's quite nice. <laughs> yeah. uh, that one said I was a good-looking one, so I'm going to take that one, and you, you can refer to me as And boy, you're looking good, Ellis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything to add to that? Um, you know, obviously, again, you're having a lot of conversation oh. with customers, obviously, you know, in terms in terms of um, you, you uh, have managed services around your own Rapid7 capabilities. Uh, obviously, we work together in terms of integrity as well. But do you, do you have any take on that, Ellis? What, what, what makes you? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Bal, Bal gets it right with, you know, some of this is culture and getting the right people to talk to your teams because, you know, there are two winners in the engagement, right? You, the sales guy is winning an engagement, but actually the customer who's getting some outcomes from it. And I think if we can do that properly, and you can get a, a real relationship where you can be honest and maybe drop a few swear words in, well, I would always drop. <laughs> but I think it's really it's about fine. transparency and not a black box service. And I think yeah. this is why I'm a key fan of owning the own tech ourselves because what I don't want is to just report at the end. What we need to do is deep dive into it, understand what's going on, because ultimately, yes, it's a service, but it, but for us, it's an extension of our team, and that's how we see uh, the whole service. And I think if you can get that right, where you've got the right team in place, the right technology in place, and you don't try to rebuild the wheel, like there are so many threat feeds out there, so much data out there that you, you can rely on from an open source point of view. Don't be building a SIM and writing your own detections on top of it. It's all like anybody who's doing that now either needs a head examined or has probably got a team underneath them that, that can cope with it, right? Yeah. Um, so leverage these you know, research houses and leverage the, the, the the vendors that are out there to take some of that away so that you can concentrate on the things that are unique to you as an organization. You know, the example I always use is, like if I'm Rapid7, unfortunately I am, um, you know, my, my view is I want to understand global threats and how threats are, are, are unfolding in the wild. And that will apply to you guys as an individual organization. But f you know, the things that are important to you, like, I don't know, you've got a policy where You've got a, a server that only access is you're only accessing it through a jump box, you know, and you want to know every time someone doesn't hit that. That's a detection that's useful for Travis Perkins, but it's not useful for everybody else. So and make and sure you're tailoring it. And, and I think this is why culture and the fit is per, is relevant for us. Otherwise, one size doesn't fit all, no. and it's really about tailoring the service so we get this true value out of what we're trying to do, <coughs> and it's meaningful for us. So, so how how do you measure that then, then Val, in terms of you know what are the, what are the What's the KPI? Is it an SLA? Is it a KPI? Is it, is it just alleviating pains in your organization? What, how do you measure that in terms of success or failure? I think I've gone away from this whole KPIs of, you know, this is the mean time to recovery, mean time to detect. I think that's just all old school. For me, it's really about what I really care about is what's the quality of data that's going into, our, into, the, um, into the service? Are we capturing everything? Is there full visibility there that we've got? And then what we're really looking at is saying, what detection do you have and what does that mean for us? So if we've got user cases for our MDR and it's being picked up and we're seeing the, the top three are always being picked on, uh, you know, they're the ones that are getting hit the most, does that mean our controls are not working? Does that mean there's something wrong in the configuration point of view? And that for me is more meaningful than just saying mean time to detect was eight minutes 
because with all due respect, that's a, that's a core service. For me, it's about how do you evolve the service. Um, I was looking at LinkedIn the other day, and I think it's now keeping people informed rather than you know, key performance indicators, and it's about keeping people interested, and I think that's so true, because for us, it's about saying, they've got to be actionable. What does that mean for us, and what can we do with that data? And that, that, that's, in, that's an interesting point, because I think, you know, that you mean time to remediation, right? What does that mean? Does that mean I've, I've kicked the attacker out of my environment and therefore we've, we've not got a threat anymore? Or does that mean that I've done you know, attack path analysis and I've, and I've gone and looked on the clear, deep and dark web for information about this threat and then I've remediated my business against it? Because that's a much more holistic approach than just saying, okay, right, we've suspended the account associated with that, that particular attack, therefore we're done. And I, I, you know, that's very difficult to measure. And I think it, we need to start thinking about how we manage risk within our environments, how our threats inform the, those risk, risk actions we take. Otherwise, we end up going round and round in circles, playing whack-a-mole, hitting the same, you know, the same threat over and over again. You weren't even in the room for the previous presentation. Was I not? You still joined that up, oh, so it's impressive. <laughs> yeah. I, think, no, I think that is, that is true, though, in terms of you know, we, we have to, um, whilst detection response is a growing beast, and we, we've become, things are becoming more understood in terms of how to detect tactics, techniques, and procedures as defined by MITRE. This is still a, d a detection and response service. This is still that someone has tripped a tripwire and we need to act upon it. I think this is where the exposure theme comes in to actually start to get to grips with this vulner legacy vulnerability management approach. And I think that that's a, you know, if we get on top of the, the C term and start to bring in new processes and approaches to that, we will uh, eliminate the pain within the MDR service. I'm supposed to be the shit, the, the the speaker, not the you know, right. question asker, not the commenter. I do this. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, sorry, I was, I was sorry. Um, go on, Alice. Go. go no, on. I was just going to say, look, and it's different response actions for different clients, right? Yeah. Depending on the power of attorney they want to hand over, because they might not want to give full power of attorney to be able to isolate accounts mm. if it has an adverse business impact. So there's always that decision of risk and decision point where you go, well, where do you want us to engage? And, you know, at what level would you want us to engage at? Because, you know, in terms of technology, the power's there in order to be able to completely lock stuff out or shut it out or whatever that case may be. But it doesn't mean you're going to do that, right? It means that how do you interface, you know, what are those escalation procedures and how are people <coughs> working together to get to a resolution? And those playbooks build out over time. You know, as we learn each other, as the, you know, we learn what the customer's trigger points are and where they're happy to have that. You know, they either build up that power of attorney over time because there's more knowledge in the environment, there's more understanding both ways, and therefore it's a much more tailored and customized experience. Because ultimately you can turn around and go, well, we've got full response capability built into all of our products. Let's hit the button and it shuts everything down. But operationally, that's just not going to fly, right? That's going <laughs> to cripple the business. And therefore, what's the, the less, least risk there? And I think that's why it's all about partnership, culture, understanding each other and working together. Because if I'm really honest, our power of attorney started very small and we built up over time because people had a fear of we're going to lose our jobs or this is, you know, and now it's just like, oh, actually, I'm going out on Friday night and I don't need to be on call that straight away or anything else because we've got somebody else looking after it. And I think for us, that's where the comfort blanket comes in. Yeah, it's good, Paul. Thanks. Yeah. I think um, just I'm going to just switch the focus a little bit in terms of confusion. I had, Bal, I'm just going to just a little bounce around with you two there. Um, Bal, do you think it's clear in terms of in the industry, um, the acronyms, the XDRs, the NDRs, the EDRs, the MDRs, I can go on. Do you, do you, feel, do you feel as a, as a, as a, as a customer that, it, that it's clear? I have to getting? write them all down, but yeah. that's why I have Google yeah. and Gartner, because that Gartner comes out with a new one every month for me. Yeah, yeah. so I'm taking that as, yes, it is confusing. Do you have a view on that? Do you, you know, do you think it's a little bit confusing? Could you explain in terms of, you know, uh, in, in simple terms, XDR versus MDR versus EDR? And a, a, a follow-on question to that is, what, what's the right? What's the right choice? Is it is it one size fits all for a 250 um, employee organisation to an 18,000 employee organisation? You know, um, could could you drill into a little bit of that clarity for people that are looking to you know um, uh, explore MDR services? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very good question. So basically, definitely there are a lot of uh, acronyms and confusions in the industry and. The end user is not to be uh, blamed about it. It's because there is a huge inf uh, amount of marketing information coming from every direction. And um, vendors sometimes, they customize the message to meet their own business 
and off uh, offerings. So that's why customers, they need to uh, read through these offerings, read to, through those technology descriptions. What do they really mean? What are the outcomes, the capabilities that are being offered? And at the end of the day, that they can decide whether this will fit their requirements or not. So there are definitely multiple uh, acronyms, like EDR, basically we all know about it, endpoint detection and response. So it's like a, a next generation endpoint security agent that will solve a lot of the problems that we face with legacy conventional antivirus products. And it takes it to the next level where if provision fails, then we have, as defenders, more opportunities to detect the attackers in our environment and we have the response capabilities, the forensics and uh, triaging capabilities, so which are missing from the legacy products. When we move, for example, to NDR, that's network detection and response, we all know that there are many network-based uh, security appliances like intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, firewalls, UTMs, they all have a lot of nice and fancy things, but they still rely on uh, traditional approaches like signature base, blacklistings, reputation, those tools, they should know about the threat before they can decide whether this is a benign connection or it's a malicious one. But they can't do anything beyond that. With NDR, no, it, it applies analytics, AI, machine learning, supervised and supervised models. It relies on uh, statistic uh, baselining. If there is a, a good traffic and suddenly it starts to deviate, okay, there is something wrong here, we need to alert the SOC. So that's like an NDR concept. When we go to MDR, MDR is like the next level of traditional SOC as a service or uh, the old classical SOC. So basically, which relies mainly on prevention, relies mainly on, okay, we have SLAs, okay, whenever we see an alert, we will inform the, cu the customer and it's up to them to go and take actions or investigate or triage the incident. MDR takes it to the next level. You will have proactive threat hunting. You will not wait for the alert to happen. You should look for the early signs, the early signals of a potential breach before it reaches to an advanced level in the cyber kill chain. Because we all know the adversaries, they start with reconnaissance, then they end up with, with the final objective. There will be multiple chances for the defenders to, dis to de prevent, to degrade, disrupt, and deny those attackers, and even to respond to them as early as possible. With an MDR offering, and with the right team, with the right monitoring, and the right tools, you'll be able to respond uh, to those breaches before they inflict uh, bigger damage to the organization. So those are critical things to keep in mind when we assess uh, and uh, shop around for uh, these tools. So if Patrick's mum was here with her AK-47s and, and held, held them yeah. to you and you had to hang your hat on one key uh, technology that, that, you, that you know all customers should have in as a, as a start of a term, which would it be? What would it be? Your EDRs, your NDRs? Which, which, what, is the, what is the most you know, impactful uh, technology that you believe you could put in place? I know that wasn't on the questions, sorry about that. But, um, yeah. So um, I'm a big fan of EDR products because they provide a lot of visibility uh, coming from a background of instant response, forensics and investigation. So this will be my first tool of selection because I will be able to have a lot of visibility across the environment and that can give me uh, a lot of details in case prevention fails I would be able to go back look at the evidence build a timeline triage the system uh, have a response actions starting from isolating the endpoint to uh, uh, create response actions to kill a process or to delete uh, artifacts so there will be a lot of capabilities that an EDR will provide on the ground because this is the last line of defense. That's the last line of, in the battle. If everything fails, at least you stop it at the EDR. Agree with that? Can I, can I negotiate with no. the no. AK wielding no. mad, That's mad person? Mom. Yeah, sure. I, I, I for me, it's like, it depends on the core business. Okay. You know, if you're a cloud-only business, potentially that's not the use case that you could, you could deploy. So I guess if I had one retorting question would be, what, what's, what's key? Yeah. You know, what's key? What sits at the center of your business that if someone gets to that point and it's going to really hurt you, what is it? And then just try and focus on you know, that initial ring of protection. If it's only one thing, it's just try and wrap a ring around that and then everything else is sort of cannon fodder to a degree. I, I still vote EDR, so I'm going to scrub out that on the recording. That's fine. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Scott, just turning to yourself in terms of obviously coming at this from a slightly different angle in terms of Orca and, and, and cloud security, you know, what, what is it, um, what, what, how do you extend uh, MDR to include cloud platform security and you know how, how are we going to deal with this new 
it's not new, but you know, this, this significant challenge and, and how do we integrate Orca and MDR together or, or cloud security and MDR together, of course. I think, I think sometimes maybe I might oversimplify things, but you know, having just been through the last presentation where we talk about the evolution of a breach and the steps and processes that attackers go through, I just see it as the same challenges that you have, we've suffered from for many years in traditional infrastructure, but now it's just on a computer that somebody else owns. So I often feel like we think about cloud as this thing that kind of lives on an island over here and you know it's completely different it's a different culture it's a different language all of these things when actually you know it's just a computer someone else owns and the basics around how we need to secure those assets that exist in the cloud are identical so when we think about MDR and we think about all the different service offerings that we have I think it goes back to the basics right how can we take ensure that we can cover those assets. So think about the coverage, the support for different types of operating systems. I think about the potentially the skills gaps as well. So you know, there's definitely a skills gap in terms of cloud knowledge and what that means for developers and how applications are published. So can that be something that's uh, addressed with the services? And then I think just addressing the same challenges that we've had, you know, too many vulnerabilities, alert fatigue, uh, perhaps you know not enough resources to deal with the volume of <coughs> alerts that tends to be you know amplified I would say at the cloud and the way the pace of things and, and where they happen but actually the fundamental principles are very very similar and they should be looked at in exactly the same way I think we're seeing a lot of that as well like you know we saw the initial access from cloud grow from four percent to ten percent last year and if you look at that growth it's because you know, we're starting to get to the stage where people are changing jobs and they're inheriting cloud infrastructure and nobody knows how it was put together, which is exactly the problem we had five, 10 years ago with normal infrastructure and vulnerabilities, right? You took over a, another IT off, um, office, it looks like a madman's knitting because nobody can kind of really hang together how it's been built. And we're gonna do the same in cloud if we're not, if we're not really careful. You know, we, I, we were seeing people putting the keys to their Amazon estate out on GitHub in code you know, leaving unsecured S3 buckets out open to the wild. Like, it's madness that we've already experienced. Can we not learn as an industry and not <laughs> I, do this again, please? I, I was going to say, I think the problem that you have is people automatically assume because it's in the cloud and it's got Azure or AWS or GCP, it's safe, it's secure. Um, what they don't realize is it's, it's a lot easier to open access than ever before. Whereas, um, and I think... Rightly so, the, the, the platform is there to, for ease of use, but it's so ease of use, it's dangerous. And I think this is why you have landing zones that you have to harden first and every, everything else, but this is why you kind of have that technology for understanding what the misconfiguration is or what the vulnerabilities are to then focus what is only a limited amount of money, a limited amount of resource to see where those choke points are to close those first. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, how am I doing for time? Can you get a couple more in? Seven minutes. Yeah, okay, forget yourself. I think um, in terms of, uh, I want to just touch on intelligence a little bit. Um, you know, what is the, the importance of, of threat, I heard I'm going to cut myself, uh, what is the um, importance of threat intelligence in terms of uh, how that comes together into to MDR to make a, you know, a more powerful um, capability? Yeah, that's a great question. So threat intelligence will uh, really help the the SOC analysts on the front line responding and investigating incidents to, ha to be informed of the latest tactics, techniques, and procedures. And uh, because the threat landscape is evolving, adversaries, they are innovating and building new tricks and uh, leveraging tools and vulnerabilities and attacks that could attack our uh, the customers' attack, uh, attack surface from on-prem all the way to cloud and in between. So basically threat intelligence will help the MDR to uh, improve their uh, uh, responsiveness and detection efficacy because at the end of the day, without having access to threat intelligence data, uh, whether you have uh, in-house researchers, uh, researchers or 
or subscribing to thre threat intelligence, subscriptions, uh, uh, having um, collaboration with the industry, with law enforcement, exchanging uh, the latest security, um, let's say, incidents and details that can really help the MDR to stay on top of the latest uh, vulnerabilities and incidents that are happening across uh, the globe. And that will really help them to uh, be more efficient when it comes to, to the next uh, zero day vulnerability, to the next worm or malware or ransomware. Without intelligence, you will be flying blind and you will rely on your own knowledge. That's why we have to always access what's on, going on in the industry on a daily basis. I'll assume you have a humongous... Uh, yeah, well, I was just experience. thinking about the NetScaler um, example that um, Patrick used a minute ago. You know, if you're doing threat intelligence right and you are you know, putting the assets that you want to monitor into a solution that, that looks for you know, your domain names or your, your users on the, the web, we were seeing that NetScaler being exploited in the wild, but we were also seeing those, those access brokers hosting it on dark web forums. So if you can get ahead of that, like, okay, I've been breached, someone's been in and got some credentials out off of me, but I've caught it at that point where someone's trying to sell it and I know the account is affected with it, so I can just, I can pull it back. And then if you, you know, that, that's great, that hopefully that gets you a miss. But if we can use, you know, to go, to go back to the remediation conversation that we were having earlier, you know, if you can then use post-breach, that remediation story to kind of go and look for the IOCs out there that, that may have been affected to, uh, that may have affected you, sorry, you start to be able to build your defenses in a way in which you're actually being attacked rather than just going, I have to do everything that the CISS top 20 control says. I can take actions that are relevant to me. Sorry about you. As I say, I think Patrick's second case study, which is about critical national infrastructure, which was quite interesting because they only had 10% of visibility. So the fact that um, an APT was in there for so long, it's not because that you can have as much threat intelligence as you want, but if you only got 10% of visibility of your state, you're flying blind anyway. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm going to have to, uh, uh, I've got one question to, to close on, to complete the circle in terms of um, AI. You know, how, uh, I had, um, you know, uh, Ellis, I'm particularly interested in yourselves in terms of the technologies side of things. You know, how are you, how is artificial intelligence, how is AI, you know, helping, you know, power the, the, the capabilities within the technologies? So I think, you know, you can use AI or, or machine learning to kind of get to a point where the intelligence that you can, you can glean from the, you know, from these threat intelligence feeds, you can weaponize into detections. And that's really, that's really useful because that takes a huge amount of sifting out of the days of the, the SOC analysts. So you, they can be focused in on the things that they, they are interested in. If you can then use that to, that, again, to, to supplement those alerts so that they can understand where they're happening, who they're happening to, and kind of what devices are affected, you get to a point where you've kind of got your arms around the breach a little bit easier. Now, workflows and, and automation and things like that, that will help in terms of kind of bringing the workload down. But if we are gonna be honest about the threat for me, the, the kind of thing that is pretty scary at the moment is social engineering has just got really, really slick. You know, you, you see these guys kind of wandering around and trying to get badge numbers and stuff like that. Right now, we're seeing what well, we saw it in a, in a client this year. Um, finance director targeted, invited onto a Zoom, Zoom call, an AI voice model and um, <coughs> deep fake of the, the CEO talking to them about a project that was top secret so he couldn't talk to the, the investors about it, and they managed to extract somewhere in the region of 40 million pounds from that organization. Now, that, they came to us after the fact and said we've had this issue because they knew that we wouldn't have seen anything in, in the, the kind of service. So we went and we did our due diligence and kind of went through everything that had happened and the events that were kind of in the, the system for that day, and there's nothing. And that's really difficult for us as, as defenders to deal with, right? Because there's no thread to pull. Unbelievable. I, I, have you, have you, what, what's been going on within Trellix world in terms of AI and, and the enhancements that that will bring to, to the capabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So at Trellix, we adopt a lot of AI machine learning models across the security stack to help defenders um, improve the, uh, their job because uh, of the sheer amount of alerts and threats that they face on a daily basis. We need to introduce <coughs> some sort of automation to analyze 
the mountains of events and data that, they, that the products are monitoring across the environment from the endpoint to the network to the cloud. And that can really help to auto-prioritize the most relevant alerts and tag it with the right context and enrichment. This, the whole thing back in the day used to be manual and it can take minutes to hours based on how ready is your SOC or, or environment to help the SOC analyst, whether you are an L1 or L2, to have access to all these data points and information and enrichment. And imagine you are dealing with large number of alerts on daily basis that can uh, lead to one thing called alert fatigue. So that's why with AI, we are taking all of this um, uh, processing to be done by the AI model and it will automatically prioritize it, provide it uh, to you and not only stop there, but it will help you to, uh, to take the actions by providing you with recommendations and response actions that can be done. There are th certain aspects that can be automated based on your uh, preference, but we are allowing the L1 to investigate and to bunch above their uh, weight because they are uh, 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 receiving the help from the AI. And this is a very innovative capability that must be there in the MDR and on the SOC environment. So, certainly we're seeing that too at Integrity, I think. It's got, is, is there any pros or cons that you're seeing in, in AI in, in, within Orca? Is it having benefits to you? Is it having ne any negatives? Is there, you know, how, how, how is it impacting? Yourself? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've certainly taken two approaches to, to AI. So again, you know, chatting to a CISO a couple of weeks ago, and he said one of the benefits of, of the AI capabilities were within the solution was what most to be, used to be a task of my most senior security analyst who'd been a developer for many, many years using AI and the ability to use natural kind of language, I can give my most junior analyst the ability to solve the most complex challenges and give them all of the context around how to do that. So the, the, the value back to the customer was, you know, I can't skill my team to keep up with the evolving threats we have within our landscape. AI enables us to do that. So there's tons of positives that's come with it. That being said, by design, AI is being leveraged extensively in the public cloud and with developers and, and DevSecOps, et cetera. So we have had to make a valiant effort to release capabilities within the technology to support securing and locking down AI. So, you know, what, what, where does my data exists within AI, what's it being used for, what's the context, how's that linked to various different um, elements of other capabilities. So we've had to, uh, and actually yesterday, introduced a ton of new AI capabilities to actually lock that down and feel safe. So um, it, it, tons of benefits for it. Thanks, Scott. Um, we have pushed for time. All of the panelists are available all day. Uh, Bal, you'll, you'll kindly um, I'll have that some time to stick around to us as well. So. Um, for any uh, uh, war stories or, or positive stories, of course. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that concludes our panel, guys. But say anyone wants to approach any of the guys, please feel free to do so. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>